Fantasy Draft is card players' top choice for daily fantasy sports action. The site offers DFS contests for the NFL, NBA, NHL, PGA, and Major League Baseball. Fantasy Draft puts the players first. With larger payout zones and contest entry caps, there are even more chances for new players to win. Check out Fantasy Draft today at cardplayer.com slash link slash fantasy draft. And when you sign up, you'll receive a free digital subscription to Card Player Magazine worth $14.99. All you have to do is head to cardplayer.com slash link slash fantasy draft and sign up to get full access to a digital archive of more than 700 issues of Card Player Magazine. And hey, you might even win some big money. Once again, go to cardplayer.com slash link slash fantasy draft for that free card player subscription and the best daily fantasy sports action around. Poker Stories is an audio series that features casual interviews with some of the game's best players and personalities. Each episode highlights a well-known figure in the poker world and dives deep into their favorite tales both on and off the felt. It's time for another Poker Stories brought to you by Card Player, the Poker Authority, and hosted by me, Julio Rodriguez. This episode, uh, episode number 12, features Justin Bonomo, who is number 21 on the all-time live tournament earnings list with more than 15.1 million. After going through what was a rough Black Friday, Justin really started to string together some huge scores. Not only does he have dozens of scores on the high roller circuit, but he also owns a WSOP bracelet and a circuit title. His biggest cash came when he took down the EPT Monte Carlo Super High Roller event back in 2012 for just over 2.1 million. 2016 was his best year so far, he cashed for 4.2 million, and so far this year he has stayed hot with six final tables and another 1.7 million in earnings. But of course, this interview wasn't all just poker talk, we got into all sorts of topics like artificial intelligence, uh, Burning Man, and uh, music of the future. So here it is, my conversation with Justin Bonomo. Here with Justin Bonomo uh, at the Aria, getting ready to play a 25K. Um, things have been going pretty well for you lately, haven't they? Yeah, life is good, poker's good, I can't complain. Yeah, um, I, you know, I... I Saw how you did well at the Hard Rock Poker Showdown uh, earlier this month, although it didn't end probably the way it should have, in your opinion, huh? Yeah, um, so... I, I, I know we're jumping right into Heartbreak, but like, if you could just walk me through that three-handed beat you took, it's pretty nasty. Yeah, so I want to give some backstory on that, because uh, the 10k 6 max at the World Series last year, there was a crazy final hand. Mm -hmm. Three players left, Marty Kozlov raises the button as the chip leader. I have like 33 big blinds or something, 35 I think, and I just shove all in from the small blind with two nines. Davidi Katai's in the big blind, and he has a little bit more chips than me, but still way less than Marty. He cold calls the all in with two sixes, so I'm way ahead of him. Mm -hmm. But then Marty just has queens. Yeah. And flops quads, boom, the tournament's over right there. No, <laughs> no heads up play. So I thought. Yeah, it's always weird when, when they don't get to the money presentation of a tournament. <laughs> Uh, usually there's a pause, uh, there's time for the reporters to, to count out the chip stacks, see who's got the eggs going in. Uh, maybe there's a presentation, depending on the tour. Yeah, this is the World Series, so they would have done the bracelet presentation. Exactly, the bracelet's sure. not even on the table and that one, and then all yeah. of a sudden the tournament's over. You know? Uh, but here we are in South Florida at the Hard Rock. This is with the 25K or the... Yeah, the 25K the high 25K roller. The 25K high roller. And we're three-handed, you're in the money. Yeah, and Lonnie moves all in on the button. Jason moves all in in the small blind. I have like 65% of the chips in play, mm -hmm. and I call all in with two queens. Yeah, they and have... it's going to work out great for you because of what happened at the World Series. For sure, and I have the best hand. They have <laughs> King, Jack, and Ten, so I'm like, oh, this is sick. I'm going to win a tournament. I'm not going to have to play heads up. Yeah. And it was a lot of money, too. Um, but no, uh, King on the flop, Ten on the river, so I finished in last place with my queens, and mm -hmm. uh, Jason was there. Jason was able to pull off a good comeback and win heads up. Yeah, but I wanted to bring that up right away before we get into the history stuff because uh, uh, you've been crushing, you know, the last few years. You're currently number 11 in our PRY. You finished third last year. Uh, do you have, like, a renewed tournament focus these days ever since uh, the high-stakes online cash game days are, are kind of, like, uh, harder to come by? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I've jumped around from game to game my whole career. Like, mm-hmm. if you go back through my career, I've played pretty much every form of poker. Uh, now the most profitable games for me seem to be these high roller tournaments. There's just tons of 25Ks and 50Ks and 100Ks pretty frequently, too. So that's definitely been where my focus is. Well, you brought, you brought up the beginning of your career. Let's just go back to the beginning of your life. Fairfax, <laughs> Virginia, what can you tell me about that? Um, nice place to grow up. You have all four seasons, good schools, very diverse, mm-hmm. safe area. And what was a young Justin Bonomo getting into? Uh, I was always a troublemaker. I was a class clown in school. Not a good student, or um, it too depends good? on the class. Too smart for your own good. Uh, I in math I always got the best grades, but like mm-hmm. in history I never handed in my assignment, so I got you know <laughs> C's and D's. Just not a fan. Didn't see uh, the usefulness. Yeah, I mean, I was just bored in school. I was one of those arrogant kids that thought he was smarter than all his teachers and stuff. Mm-hmm. And just was like, what's the point of this? What's the worst trouble you ever got into? Uh, I never did anything that bad. It was mostly just, like, cracking jokes in class. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, the, like, biggest punishment I got in school was, oddly enough, for a fight where I didn't fight back. So things like that would just okay. make me bitter. And, like, I would get in more trouble because I would resent <laughs> stuff like that. I'm having flashbacks to my own third grade experience, but I want to hear yours. <laughs> um, this is a kid Bu- that was a bully, or uh, kind of, but like we were also kind of friends. Um, he was only at our school for one year. Mm, um, one of those kids had to make <laughs> friends quick. Yeah, not, pretty o- not much. always the uh, the smoothest transition. Uh, yeah, he just like it wasn't even a huge fight. He kicked me in the stomach in the bathroom, and then like the teachers heard about it, and we both got the same amount of punishment, even though I didn't do anything. And the injustice. Yeah of uh, a Fairfax, Virginia middle school. Yep. So then, uh, you know, what was uh, what was the the plan with the University of Maryland? What were you? What was the initial focus? Um, so I started making money at poker when I was seventeen. Um, by the time I entered college, I knew I was never going to finish. Mm-hmm. I just kind of wanted the social experience. And... So you went into college knowing you weren't going to finish it. Ninety nine percent, yeah. Okay, so what was the major, or were you just taking, like, general studies, or what was the goal? Just to acquire what information? What were you trying to get out of it? Not information. Like, I was a math major, but I didn't even get to, like, the game theory classes or anything. Um, again, I just wanted the social experience to mm-hmm. make friends and And how long, how long did you uh, stick around for? I was only there for one semester. Mm-hmm. Um, I good told... experience? Bad? It was good. I made some good friends. Were you right that it was there ever a point where you're in class and you're like, maybe I can finish this, maybe I can do this? No, and I think that would have been irresponsible, to be honest. Mm-hmm. And let me clarify that, like, my mm-hmm. case is, like, very unique. I don't recommend this path for everyone out there for sure. Um, but I kind of knew that, okay, it's 2002 or whatever. Um, nobody has, it was actually before that, 2001, I guess. Um, nobody has. That makes sense for your freshman year. Then? Oh, no, th- no, that's when I started playing online. So it was, like, 2003. 2003 actually, yeah, you're, yeah. you're younger than me. Okay. Um and I, I realized, like, okay, online poker is so easy. Nobody has any idea what they're doing. For sit and goes, like, I figured out push fold ranges, and other people still have no idea that that's a thing. Like, mm-hmm. people were just starting to figure out ICM. And yeah, poker is just so easy. I could have trained a monkey to make $100,000 a year. And I, I calculated that I was making a little over $300 an hour. Oh my God. Even and, back then. Yeah. Even back then being as green as you were in, in the poker world. Yeah, I mean, I was 16 tabling the $200 sit and goes, and when they eventually came out with higher sit and goes, I was playing those as well. Back on party. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, but I'm really proud of myself for having the foresight that, like, okay, people are going to figure this out. The good money never stays, like, that easy forever. Mm-hmm. So I need to play as much as I can right now. Um, and I was also aware that eventually AI would come along, and once there's bots, like, humans won't be able to compete. It'll be... The exact same as chess is online. You can't play chess for high stakes online because there might just be an AI on the other end. Yeah. And I always knew that poker was going to end up that way. So I decided, like, I can't just spend all this time in school. I need to pursue my passion while I still can. As That's interesting. Most people would see a dying industry and say, okay, I'm going to get away from that. It's like, no, you know, well, maybe that's not true. Half the country still believes in coal. But <laughs> <laughs> you saw an opportunity and you pounced on it. How, I'm curious, uh, do you think poker has a, a clock on it? Oh, absolutely. And there's a chance that 40 years from now it will exist in some crazy form that we can't even imagine right mm-hmm. now. But yeah, for sure No Limit Hold'em will not be a playable game for high stakes in 25 years. Like, no chance. So we still have some time. No, um, that's 
it'll take less time than that. Okay. Um, interesting couple days uh, for that development. It, it, um, We're talking about Libratus and uh, the bots? No, 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 not at all. Um, I mean, that is relevant, of course. Mm -hmm. um, like, no one's ever disagreed that eventually there will be an algorithm that's just better than humans at poker. Of course. Um, but the question has been, like... Well, obviously, like, when will that come to be? But also, how will it affect live poker? And Elon Musk just announced, like, yesterday or the day before. I haven't even had time to read this yet. But it's some kind of Neuralink that just hooks up into your brain. And you'll just be able to... So, again, I haven't read this yet. But the stuff I've been reading, the sci-fi stuff, you know, 20 years ago, basically said we'll be able to have access to the Internet wherever we go without even using our hands. We don't need a screen. We'll just be able That's to... pretty true. ...to think, <laughs> like, Wikipedia, tell me this thing, and we'll get the information. Okay, so you foresee a world where this is wearable technology that will make live poker obsolete or an implant or... Sorry, I'm just uh, going down this path with you in the future and I'm trying to see what it would look like and so the first step, what the World Series would even look like. That's even more bizarre. The first step already exists. There are these bots that play Limit Hold'em far mm -hmm. better than any human can. So if you're playing Heads Up Limit Hold'em for high stakes online, there's a good chance you're playing against a bot. Mm -hmm. Um... And eventually that'll be No Limit 2. Like, there are definitely bots at lower stakes No Limit, but not the super high stakes yet. Um, and the, but, the Carnegie Mellon uh, University bot that they created, obviously, is very well. Is very good at heads-up No Limit Hold'em, and, you know, they're working on a six-handed version of it as well, so we're close. For sure. I don't know that any, um, any players have access to that yet, but there's mm -hmm. no theoretical reason why they couldn't. Mm -hmm. Um... So then the question is, what what's this going to look like for live poker? And it was something like 20 years ago where the technology first existed that a paralyzed person could control a computer mouse with their brain. Mm -hmm. So, like, we've already had proof that this eventually would happen. Um, and what I think it's going to be is an implant in your a neocortex, like right in your brain. And so you won't be able to see it, you won't be able to detect it, and eventually it'll be just like every single person has these walking around, so you can't really restrict them. Wouldn't that eliminate everything, not just poker, <laughs> but any competition of any sort? Um, like, certainly mental ones, memorizing stuff. But even physical, I mean, there's a lot of mental aspects of even, like, physical sports that people need to be sharp at. If you could get a chip for that, I mean, if the outfielder knows yeah. when to hit the cutoff man rather than, you know, throwing home... Yeah, stuff like sure. little things like that, you know what I mean? If like a quarterback can like be exactly, told to read throw the defenses, the ball to, you know what I mean? Like yeah, exa you, you'd think that technology like that would make everything obsolete. Well, the interesting thing is it doesn't need to be obsolete, it just needs to be changed. Changed, yeah, different. Yeah. The end of it as we know it different moving forward. So for a lot of this AI stuff, I've been very interested in Ray Kurzweil who was considered um, the leading predictor of the future for a long time and now he's at the head of uh, Google's AI department. Okay. And um, one thing he's kind of been predicting is that, um, so this is one of the smaller things, he makes huge predictions, but he talks about music, and he basically says that music 50 years from now, if you played it for a human, they just like wouldn't get it. It would be like if we played music for a bird they, or a cat, they wouldn't hear it at the same... You mean music, music from 50 years from now? Yeah, in the future. Oh, I feel that way about music now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, he basically thinks that you'll need to be altered to understand it at the frequency or pitch that it's played at or whatever, and it'll just be far more complicated, but we'll still be able to enjoy it in the future with our implants and advanced brains. Wow. That's... Sorry, I'm just tripping out a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> it's pretty cool stuff for you, sure. You brought up music, so let's transition there. Um, I read an interview from almost 10 years ago that said, when well, you said that you'd been to almost 200 concerts... How, how, how big is that number now? Um, probably in the low 200s. Oh, really? Count. Yeah. You, you've uh, gone away from your music concert days? or? Uh, no, I mean, now it's more like bigger festivals than local, mm -hmm. local concerts, but no, I still go to a bunch. So what's your what's your musical taste these days looking like? Um, mostly EDM, uh, specifically trance. Mm -hmm. uh, Above and Beyond is my favorite DJ. Uh, I just saw them at um, Seasons Festival in Vancouver last week, and it was fantastic. All right, so for a hater like me who thinks all they do is just push play uh, on their on their iPod, which is the oldest old man statement I can make, uh, sell me on it. Um, like, why do you care if some dude is playing a guitar in front of you? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think, just like we talked about AI, this is the future of music. Instead of uh, just having sticks and strings, we're going to be able to 
calculate like what music will trigger the highest emotional frequency. Right, in a the human. art isn't in being able to physically strum a guitar. It's it's the arrangement of the actual notes. Okay, yeah, absolutely, I could buy that. So. Um, I mean, it's certainly when you go to a concert, like the energy is really important, mm -hmm. but. I mean, I've been to rock concerts. The energy at rock concerts sucks. And I love rock music. I grew up on rock music. But that, you, that was your, uh, were you a Tool fan? or uh, uh, Our Lady Peace, Radiohead, Live, okay. Smashing Pumpkins, Pearl Jam. Yeah. Yeah, all that stuff. I never graduated from that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I still listen to a good amount of it, for sure. Yeah. Um, but, like, still, um, it's like brooding, angry teenagers and mosh pits and stuff. <laughs> But if you go to a rave, it's the best energy you'll ever see at any live music event. Everyone is just, like, loving and happy and dressed in all these crazy colors and just super accepting and just having a great time. Uh, well, I, that leads me right into Burning Man, which uh, you've expressed a lot of love for. Um, you've also said, you know, it's not for everyone. I think, was like, 80,000 people go? 70,000, yeah. 70,000 people each year go. So it's, it is literally not for everyone. <laughs> But to somebody who's never been and probably will never go, uh, what is it, and why is it so great? And should so, I go? Yeah, you would love it, for sure. Really? Um, I don't know how you deal with the bad conditions, but uh, let me just Terrible. give you an overall summary of it. <laughs> um, so most people, they haven't heard much about it, they think it's just some other music festival, and it's not a music festival right. at all. It's basically a pop-up city. And what makes it so great is actually how little they provide. If you go to a music festival, they provide the stage, they provide the music, they provide the lights, and that you pay your ticket, that's what you get. When you go to Burning Man, they tell you, okay, you're coming not as, um, not as a customer, you are a participant. Everything that exists at Burning Man is because of people like you, the 70,000 people that come. They're all told they need to provide something. And sure, some people do provide music and stages. Like mm -hmm. Some super rich camps have Paul Oakenfold fly out and help. But the play. idea is like the artists do the their art, the musicians do their concerts. Uh, the baker bakes bread for exactly. everyone, and some guys in the corner uh, selling sunblock or something or giving well, away sunblock. Yeah, you you can't sell anything. There. Okay. Um, so you know, you'll have these big theme camps that um, some are bringing DJs, some are bringing a $5 million, 70-foot wooden statue that they just burn to the ground at the mm -hmm. end of the week. Um, I went with uh, the poker player camp, Camp Epic, and we just did cookouts every day from 1 to 3 o'clock, serving hundreds of hot dogs, hamburgers, and vegetarian So you just bring well. all the supplies with you, mm -hmm. and then you just set up shop, and people show up or they don't? or Yeah, we, we announced on the schedule like what time we're serving. And okay. we stood outside the camp with a megaphone saying, hey, you look hungry, come get a hamburger. And had a lot of fun with it. And So is there like anybody checking people at the door saying, hey, did you bring anything for the party? No. Um, I'm wondering how it's policed. And is do people volunteer to be police officers? <laughs> um, so they do have police officers there, but that's just because, you know, it's in Nevada. They wouldn't allow the event to run without police officers. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess the official, unofficial rules of Burning Man are... The ten principles, uh, which include uh, gifting, participation, uh, leave no trace, which just means you clean up after yourself. And the thing is, they don't need to police it. it. I think what makes it work is if you just had this event in Las Vegas, it wouldn't work. But you have to go... To corporate? Um, well, it's just like if anyone could just take a taxi... Right, it wouldn't right. be that special. It needs to be like a pilgrimage. It needs exactly. to hurt a little to get there. So it's in the middle of the desert. It's kind of hard to get there. It's hard to get a ticket. Mm -hmm. And it's rough conditions. It's super hot during the day, super cold at night. You'll swallow liters of dust throughout the week because there's crazy dust storms. Like I, I literally watched tornadoes be formed in front of my own eyes. Um, if it rains, it just floods like crazy. Um and you don't have showers, uh, you're probably using porta potties. So, like, and you have to bring your own food, you have to bring your own water, you have to bring your own everything. So, it really takes a lot of work to get there. So, people that just like, I don't really know what this is, but I'll check it out, they're not going to come to Burning Man. Yeah. People that are like, oh, I just want to look at the, these weird, crazy weirdos, they're not going to come to Burning Man. The people that come are, oh, I love these 10 principles, I want to be a part of this, I want to live it. Is it just like a social experiment to see if it can happen? Or are people being encouraged to take this out into the world? Or is it Both. Uh, like the purge? 
where people just need to get it out of their <laughs> system once a year? <laughs> uh, definitely not the purge. Um, it's for sure a social experiment. Um, they said, here are these 10 utopian values. Let's see what happens when we mm -hmm. create literally a pop-up city where people need to live by these values. And it was a crazy success. Yeah. And one of the things they tell people is this doesn't have to be one week of the year. Bring this back to your home. Bring this back to your community. Share mm -hmm. what you love with other people. And for sure, every year after Burning Man, I have a renewed inspiration to find new ways to incorporate these values in my life. Well, how does that gel with the lifestyle of a poker player where... You're taking a tourist money and check raising somebody out of the mortgage payment. I mean, I'm, that's devil's advocate there. But No, no, that's something I have a huge problem with. And uh, I do have a huge problem with the fact that uh, when I play poker, I'm providing nothing to society. Um, that's a big part of the reason I've been a, an avid supporter of Reg Charity. Um, mm -hmm. It's a way to analyze, like, how can I help out the world in the most efficient, best way possible. And also um, from an inward perspective too it does wear down on me i'm with grumpy people all the day smoke filled environments um uh, people that don't care about uh global warming in the environment and i i wish i was part of a burning man community 24 7 and it's unfortunate that my job is pretty much as far away from that as possible but overall it's i mean there's almost two communities in the poker world there's the pros and then there's the 80 percent who don't make any money and just gift and gift and just doing it for fun. Um, but speaking specifically about the pros, what do you see in, in that community that you like and that you dislike? Um, so I, I know what you're getting at that um, I, I don't really need to spell it out, but um, I, I'm really proud of my group of friends in particular because we've come such a long way. Uh, when we were 22 and playing poker together, like we just had no idea about the world and we were your arrogant 22 year olds that just fell into piles of cash and did ridiculous things um, but now we've like really grown together a lot of us have gotten into shape we eat healthy we do things like meditate and practice yoga we go to Burning Man together and I, I think we've been like it's not an accident we've been a positive influence on each other and we've grown together and we have figured out what's important in life together mm -hmm. and actually some of the hardships in poker have actually helped out uh, Black Friday was kind of a wake-up call to a lot of us, and we just needed to work harder both in poker and our lives, and just, I, I guess when bad things happen, you kind of think like, okay, not everything's bad, like here are the good things in my life, here are the things I should focus on and work harder on. Well, was Black Friday like your lowest point, or? Yeah, for sure. I was dating an amazing, beautiful girl in the United States. Uh, I had my best month in poker in March of 2011, right before it happened. And then, boom, just out of a sudden, all my money's locked up. I don't have a job anymore. My girlfriend says she's going to break up with me if I quit poker for her. And it was a rough time. <laughs> I can imagine that being a tough one. Um, but it kind of jump-started a, a big live boom for you. Was there a, a rough transition period? Yeah. Um, it was really unfortunate for me because I was like really on top of the online high-stakes cash games. And I just kind of like waited Black Friday out and it took me um, almost a year to get uh, back playing online poker again. And by that time, like the top players had just like way surpassed me, especially at heads up. Um, How fast do you think it takes before, you, before you're just a dinosaur if you're not keeping up, you know what I mean? Uh, it, How fast is the game changing? It depends on what level you're competing at. If you're just playing a uh, live 510 in Vegas, you could stop playing for five years, come back, and you'd still be fine. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're playing against like literally the 10 best heads-up players in the world, uh, it could just be three months before, yeah. before five of them pass you. Everything you're doing is outdated and <laughs> exploitable. And... Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's, get in, let's get into the big scores. 2012 EPT Grand Final Monte Carlo. I have to imagine... I mean, that's still your biggest score, I have to imagine. Is that your biggest poker moment, or do you like the bracelet more? Or? Um, no, actually. Um, I had That's the smallest percent of myself I've ever had in any tournament I've ever entered. <laughs> your biggest score? Yeah. yeah. Well, it was a big buy-in, so... Wait, no, that was the uh, 100K? Yeah. Yeah. That's a big buy-in. Yeah, for sure. Um, <laughs> I like it. it was still a great win. It means a lot to me, but um, I wouldn't say it's one of my five proudest or most important moments. Like, the other thing is it's a 40-player tournament, and mm -hmm. I just got dealt aces and flopped a full house every hand, so... Like, <laughs> 
Yeah. So what is uh? So what is the one you you hang your hat on? Uh, honestly, when I was nineteen. Okay. Uh, I was playing my second EPT. Uh, this is EPT Deauville season one, and I made the televised final table, which meant I was the first teenager ever to be on TV for poker. And that's cool. Yeah, that's a stat I didn't know existed, but I, I like it. Yeah, and that's something no one will ever take away from me. That will mm -hmm. always be true. And I remember after I made the final table, I called my parents. I was just so excited, yeah. just on the verge of tears on the phone. And what did the parents? Uh, what, well, first of all, what do your parents do, and what did what did they think of you in poker? Uh, they're retired. Um, my mom has been in law enforcement. She's been an intake counselor in a jail, which means she's like tells the inmates like this is where you're going to be housed. If you have a problem, come to me and oh, stuff okay. like that. And my dad has been in uh, random software and tech jobs throughout his career. Um, my dad, so before I played poker, I played Magic, a strategic card game. Mm -hmm. And my dad would drive me four hours to a Magic tournament when I was 14 years old. And he saw that, you know, I was very good at that. And Was he just, like, really into um, uh, promoting what you were into? Or was he also himself a card guy? Um, I mean, he enjoyed Blackjack, uh, so he kind of, like, saw... You know the appealing mathematical elements, but he didn't play magic at all. Uh, okay. He was just an amazing father that would just drive me four hours and then like <clears throat> sit in a coffee shop all day while I played. <laughs> like, there's nothing he wouldn't have done for me. Side note: I'm taking my dad to Burning Man this year as a thank you. Yeah, uh, for all the wonderful awesome. things he's done. Um, but yeah, so he saw the kind of academic elements of magic. He saw how. Uh, successful at it I was and he kind of figured poker would be the same thing he knew I was a sharp responsible kid and he kind of never worried about so me. so no pushback when you dropped out no um both my parents thought it was a mistake my mom took a little longer to come around she didn't really see the academic um positives in either magic or poker and uh she kind of just thought it's gambling eventually people lose in gambling and there's no way around that uh now she's my biggest supporter by far. She's realized that, like, okay, I'm actually good at this competition that I partake in. And I'm not competing against these billion-dollar casinos. I'm competing only against... Only took 15 million in earnings. <laughs> no, it only took her a couple of years. It's actually super cute. If I'm doing well in a tournament, she'll keep clicking refresh on the updates, and she'll call my grandparents and call the neighbors. Oh, that's nice. And she's built a poker shrine. Like, I've given her my trophies, my bracelet, and she has all my magazine articles and stuff. <laughs> I like it. So um, let's get to some of the big results. Second in the Seminole Hard Rock, second in the 50K, second <laughs> a in lot the of second Aria places. Super High Roller. So you know where I'm going with this. Um, do you feel snake bit at, at final tables? Or do you, because you, I mean, you have a lot of runner up finishes. A lot of third place finishes, too. Some third, some fourth, a fifth, a big fifth there, but. Um, is this is this a matter of uh, of uh, game style at the end or variance or? I was looking at this recently. Something like for my four, I have fourteen second and third place finishes before I have a win. If you go back, uh, my recent Hendon mob um, number might be slightly off. Um, the thing, it, it would be very easy to look at this negatively and I'd be like, oh, that sucks. I'm so unlucky. I'd have so much more money if I had all these first place finishes. But actually, I've run really lucky final tables. I have very few five, six, seven, eight, ninth place mm -hmm. finishes. Um, and most people overanalyze this stuff, like, uh, here's a stylistic thing that I'm doing. Like, no, it's really just luck. Yeah, he's I, not I, a closer. <laughs> I, I'm, Which is so ridiculous. Like, who, who, who gets hit with the deck heads up is going to win most of the time, I mean. For sure. And, like, I, I've run really good with six players left in tournaments, and I've run really bad with three players left in tournaments, and that's just how it is. And, like, I, I've worked harder on heads up than the vast majority of my opponents exception for the mixed games like if i play horse heads up i'm probably outclassed and i did get second in the horse and second in 50k game but certainly for no limit tournaments i think i'm far better than the average opponent i'll encounter at the heads up portion of a tournament so you get second place in a tournament any tournament high roll or whatever um is that celebration night or is it go home and sulk for a few hours celebrate tomorrow Honestly, I don't even celebrate when I get first. I'm just really? so mentally exhausted after a long hour of playing high stakes mm -hmm. poker against tough competition. I, I don't get how people have the energy to like scream and party. Like I just want to <laughs> flop into well, a I'm bed. Well, I'm not saying you're probably far removed from the days when you're popping bottles at the club, but you know what I mean. Like uh, when, when do you let yourself? Um, when do you give yourself an attaboy for for getting the job done? 
Um, or is it all just hey, that's just nine the nine to five clock in clock out. It, it totally depends how it goes down. If you're like the short stack and you squeak into second place, you're pretty much happy right away. But if you're the chip leader and you take a horrible beat to finish third place or whatever, then yeah. then it's kind of rough. Um, yesterday I bubbled the 25k and like I kind of have this routine where it's like okay I'm gonna be upset for the next hour and after that I'll just go back to my life because you know yeah it, it sucked how it went down bubbling any high stakes tournament sucks but at the end of the day my life is still the same and mm -hmm. I have a lot to be grateful for that seems to be a very very common thread I'm seeing with a lot of the young successful high stakes players these days they are generally happy which is not always true of every poker player. I mean, I, 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 am I wrong there, or it just seems like the younger kids, uh, not the younger kids, the younger guns on the high stakes circuit have are figuring something out right now that's turning into positive results. Um, I'm honestly not sure how related those two things are that directly. Uh, I I think the common we talk about balance and you know once you find balance in your life all of a sudden the results start to follow. Yeah, um, I I guess the common bridge I would draw between those two it would be um, meditation, because meditation is something that both makes you better at poker and makes you happier in life, and a lot of people that have studied anything like meditation realize that just being grateful causes a lot of happiness. And I know a lot of people that have routines like Dan Smith journals every day and he just writes three little things that he's grateful for. And, you know, the studies on happiness aren't like super scientific, super official, but there does seem to be a common thread that people that spend even just a little bit of time in their day thinking about what they have to be grateful for are legitimately happier because of it. Yeah, and do you think that affects your poker results? Um, it can. Um... I think what mindfulness and meditation really let you do is just not be bogged down by all the stuff that doesn't matter. If you're at the poker table and you're thinking like, oh, I'm so unlucky, I got into a car accident this morning and I'm miserable and what traffic, whatever, uh, then you're not going to be focusing about the cards. Or if you're focusing on, oh, I can't believe my ace-king lost to ace-queen an hour ago, like I'd have all the chips in play. like. No, you're not, you're not gaining anything by thinking about that. You should be thinking about what matters, studying your opponents, thinking about how you're going to play future hands. Right, it already happened, let it go. There's a hand in front of you right now. Exactly. And if you're able to think about that, I think it will definitely help your ability to focus at the poker table. Um, I really don't know how to, do, how to bring this up, but <laughs> multi-accounting, I mean, here's uh, the problem I have with it. I don't want to bring it up. When can I stop bringing it up? You know what I mean? Like, Norman Chad mentioned it on ESPN. And I don't know when is it okay for us to just move on. In the poker world in general, what is forgivable? What is not forgivable? Uh, what is, uh, who needs to be called out, who doesn't? I don't know how, um, who gets to criticize? You know what I mean? Like, I don't know what the answers are here. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Um, I mean, it's fair criticism, to be honest. I made a mistake when I was 19 years old, and that's something I'll have to live with. Right, but every, do you have to live with it? I don't understand why we have to keep harping on it. You know what I mean? So, like, let's move on to other issues. So, we have a bunch of pros who were involved in the full tilt thing. Well, how long do we give them shit for? You know what I mean? It's, it's a case yeah. by case, you know? Like... I mean, I definitely think it's case by case, and I, I don't think forgetting about it is ever actually the healthy thing to do, and and I've actually gained a lot from having this experience. You know, I, I was able to convince myself, like, oh, there's technically no rules against it at this point in time, so, and other people are doing it, and now I, I've come into many situations recently where it's like, okay, other people are doing this, so maybe it's okay, and it's like, oh, no, I've made this mistake before, I'm not going to make that mistake again. Yeah. Well, so I've, I've learned a lot from it, for sure. And I think that's what you want to look for. When people make mistakes, are they learning from it? Because um, the same time I was doing what I was doing, JJ Prodigy was doing the same thing. Yeah. And he got caught, and then he just kept doing it, and he kept doing it, and he kept doing it. So especially in that case, like, no, you don't forget about it. Mm -hmm. I, I think you need to look at, like, how is this person? how does this person feel about it? Are they legitimately sorry? Do they really regret what they did? Or is this just who they are? Are they just going to keep Chino reaming it 24-7? So, yeah, I'm just wondering, like, you know... Do you feel ever like that you, like you're not allowed to call people out or do I you feel like you have to hold back because of that? 
Yeah, I do. Um, especially uh, things related with online poker and multi-accounting and stuff. Uh, which is unfortunate because I think that I, I do have a lot of feedback that and insight that I might have specifically because of the situations that I've been through and the people that mm-hmm. I've known. Um, but yeah, if I call anyone out for anything ethical, of course, there's always going to be those haters on the internet that say, like, you're not perfect either, except they say that in a much harsher way, obviously. <laughs> uh, what do you think of this new trend of people just blasting? Because the poker world, unfortunately, is full of a lot of people with debt or people who failed to pay back uh, part of uh, stakes or swaps or whatever. Do you feel like everything should be 100% transparent? I, I think it would be better that way. Um, because we have a situation now where people in the know, they, they share this information. But it's always like, okay, you can't tell anyone, but this happened. And it, it just sucks getting that. Mm-hmm. Because, like, what if I see someone trusting this person that I have this secret information? like, yeah. And I'm not allowed to tell them? That just Why not just share it with everyone? Let people know. And a lot of people do have their real reasons. Like, sometimes people will say... Oh, give me six months and maybe I'll try to pay you back. But if you spread this on the internet, then no, I'm never paying you back. And especially if like a friend tells you this information, like you want your friend to get paid back, and exactly, it's not really your place to break a promise that your friend made you. Well, have you been burned in the past? Oh yeah, for sure. Brutally or <laughs> um, not super brutally. Um, a lot of small figures, no huge ones. Um, I love your Twitter tagline these days. Enough snowflakes can cause an avalanche. I'm wondering, <laughs> I'm wondering how you're, you're doing <laughs> these days with, with the world as it is. Um, it, it sucks seeing Donald Trump as president for sure. Uh, taking a lot of steps backwards. Um, the thing is... If you look at the past six months, like, yeah, things are going in a horrible direction. But if you look at the past 20 years, things are so much better now than they used to be. Um, I, I'm going to get these statistics wrong, but in, call it 1960, something like 75% of the planet was living off of less than a dollar a day. Mm-hmm. Now that number is less than 10%. So far fewer people are living in poverty. Far fewer people are starving. Technology is going amazing places. And even though, yeah, we've taken a step backwards with things like global warming, but I think in the end we are going in the right direction. I feel better now. (laughs) Especially now that we've been talking about implanting me with a chip that makes me super smart and good at poker. Well, I could say something that will immediately scare you if you like. No, please don't. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I, I love this one line on your Wikipedia page that says you donated to a life extension project. I don't know why it's there. I'm, I mean, it just seems like one random detail, but I want to hear more about this life extension. Um, and so, where can I get some? So it was called SENS, which means Strategies for Engineered Negligible Senescence. Senescence is just aging, so it's basically trying to stop aging and aging-related related diseases like Alzheimer's. Okay. And what's interesting is they've pinpointed what aging means, and it's basically a list of seven things that happen in a cell. And for each one, they know how to stop it or at least prevent it majorly. Mm -hmm. The problem is, like, what you do in a lab on one cell, how do you do that to an entire body? So, like, we haven't perfected it. We're still really far away. But the point is the science is there. It's something in our our reach, something we can do. And... To do what? um, To stop aging. So the perspective... Are you saying to live forever or to live a little longer? Um, Neither. (laughs) Um, I mean, yes, you will live longer as a result of this, but um, people hear this and they think, oh, why would I want to live as a 200-year-old person? Like, no, if you're 30 and you stop aging, you will live in a 30-year-old body your whole life. Nobody wants to age. It's something bad that happens. Like, when people get decrepit and die, they're not like, oh, I'm glad this part of my life existed. No, they think, like, I wish I was healthier. I wish I could still walk in a park. Like, that was great. Um. But so the perspective this charity kind of starts with is the same as effective altruism, which is like, how can I use my resources to either help the most people possible or reduce as much suffering as possible? And the number one killer by far across the entire world is aging and aging related diseases. It kills so many people and 
for some reason, we think of cancer as this disease we need to cure, but aging people don't think of it that way. And this charity disagrees and says, well, let's look at it like a disease. Let's try to save lives. Let's try to make people healthier. What age would you want to stop at? I know this is ridiculous <laughs> science fiction time because we're probably uh, not in our lifetimes. But, uh... I mean, I'm, I'm 31. I'm past the peak, so I would certainly stop aging right now. Stop if right I could. now? It's all yeah. downhill from here? Yeah, I mean, what, what's the human peak? 25 or something? I guess the mind and the body peak at different times. But Yeah. Well, I don't think I'd want to be 25. I feel smarter when I, once I hit 30, but well, just because tired air for sure. Just because your body stops aging doesn't mean you <laughs> stop learning. And I guess so. I guess that's true. Man, the stuff you, you brought up today is just... <laughs> it's trippy. Uh, first big live tournament experience. Do you remember what it was and how you felt, who you played against? Um, a lot of memories. Um, my first ever live tournament, I was 18, went to Turning Stone Casino for their $500 tournament. Quickly got in, ace-king against ace-queen to bust and lose. Um, but then two days later, they had a $30 rebuy tournament, which I played and I won. So okay. I won my second ever live tournament, which was sweet. Third was on WPT Aruba, which, oh, ridiculous ridiculous hand so like i satellited into this like my first big tournament 10k buy-in mm -hmm. uh and were you were you nervous or were you just no i was some an hot shot on online kids you're fine overconfident 19 year old for yeah. sure and a ridiculous hand it goes like raise call 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 some guy misclicks and re-raises like four more calls <sighs> and like, everyone knows this guy misclicked. Everyone knows he doesn't have a hand. So I just, like, shove all in. This is, like, level one of a WPT. So it's for, like, 200 big blinds or whatever. Probably maybe even more. I just have Jack-9 suited. This is preflop. Yeah. Oh, man. And some guy calls me with ace-jack. And it was a pretty ridiculous way to bust my first ever WPT. But I had a lot of heroism in me. <laughs> but then my second WPT a few months later was the... PCA at the Bahamas, and I got 30th in that and cash in that, and that kind of uh, inspired me to play more live tournaments. Awesome. Uh, worst bad beat you ever put on anybody? Ooh, um... I honestly have no idea. <laughs> you don't we, remember that. We all remember the bad beats we've taken. I can't yeah. remember the worst one I put on someone else. <laughs> well, I'm not gonna let you tell a bad beat story. <laughs> all right. I think we started with one, so... Uh, biggest pot you've ever won or lost? Your choice. Um... I don't know. It, if we're talking like dollar amount, it's easier to go with cash games. It was probably when I was battling Isildur at 300, it could be 600 too, online. Like equity in a tournament. Yeah. Um, I mean, most of my biggest pots were versus Isildur at 300, 600, no limit heads up. Was this during um, the Victor Blom is on top days or when he was trying to come back? Yeah, this is like 2009, 2000, 2010, actually. Um, so you're playing 300, 600? Yeah. What happened? Uh, he ran a million dollars above all in EV against me. <laughs> <laughs> was there one particular brutal hand, or...? Um, no, just tons just... of... He he didn't run it twice and just was an action player. The money went in pretty easily. A lot of action. Um, what about gambling degen stories? you make any prop bets, or uh, is that... I'm not, you stay really, away from. I'm not really much of a degen. I don't like play for the adrenaline rush in poker. Um, I, I've made a bunch of prop bets. I guess for a while people knew about my Panorama Towers prop bet where I would lay something like 8 to 1 odds that somebody living in Panorama Tower would win a That's bracelet right. every summer. Who was the one who won it for you? Greg Mueller was a... Yeah, one year he won two bracelets for me living there. I feel um, like he did it like last minute one year and that was the one who saved you. But, uh, yeah, so what happened to the fraternity of poker players in the middle? Scott still lives there. Black Friday happened to us. I remember, so, like, we had a core group of, like, seven or eight people. And a year later, so it was the World Series 2012, uh, we were having uh, dinner at a sushi restaurant in Vegas. And the eight of us had all lived at Panorama together. And now we were in seven different cities and six different countries just spread across the world. That's crazy. How many... Uh people from your original crew are even still around um i'm talking about the original crew you broke broke back into the game that sounds terrible okay the <laughs> the original group of friends you had when you first got into poker um because i imagine you've lost some people along the way people who just said you know what i, I can't i gotta go do the 95 
I didn't really come up with a crew. Like, I was definitely inspired to start playing uh, professional poker by Brock Parker. Okay. Um, Another um, magic Old school guy. magic player, yeah. Uh, I, mean, I remember I was 15 years old, and I was just watching him play 100, 200 limit online. It was like, wow, just two minutes of clicking, and you won a $2,000 pot. This is crazy. Yeah. Um, and I thought maybe I could win a tenth as much money as he did. Um, but yeah, so I had people I was inspired by, but when I started, I didn't really have a crew. And like eventually I met people through 2 plus 2 and PCA and stuff like that, but I kind of started on my own. Okay, uh, what's your favorite thing about being a poker pro? Uh, definitely the lifestyle. I get to do what I want, uh, don't have a boss. Uh, I can play online poker or fly to a crazy city and play. It's just all up to me. What's your schedule look like these days? Uh, this is the super busy time of the year. Um, I literally do not have a single free day uh, from now till July 15th, so three straight months of uh, playing. I, I will take some days off. Um, specifically, I'm taking, I always take four days off for EDC, Electric Daisy Carnival in Vegas every summer. Um, that's really it. Like, if I get burned out, maybe I'll take one or two days off, but pretty much playing every single day. And the rest of the year, it's basically 25Ks and up, or...? Um, yeah, so I'm not going to fly to another country to play 110K. It's just not worth it. Mm -hmm. um, when Arya has three tournaments in a row, it's generally worth it. I generally won't fly to Vegas for just two 25Ks. Um, if there's something like an EPT where it's great schedule, there's at least a 5K every day, then like those are pretty exciting. You but, mentioned that right now you're, you know, the high rollers are what you're really doing well at. Do you feel like that's an ecosystem that can survive long term? Um, possibly. Um, the thing is, all it takes is a few recreational players to keep them alive. We've what we've seen a lot of in the Aria tournament specifically is you'll have a lot of pros that will hear about these tournaments. They'll play two or three, and then they'll just realize like, wow, these things are really tough. The pros are really tough, and mm -hmm. they won't keep playing anymore. Um. So yeah, for it, it's certainly not a gold mine. It's not like any pro can just jump in and make tons of money. You have to be really, really good to be able to make money in these games. Uh, favorite tournament destination? Hmm. Uh, I gotta go with um, Melbourne, Australia, Aussie Millions. It's also perfect because it's February, where in North America it's like super cold and brutal, and there it's just seventy degrees and sunny every day. But the food's great. The people are super friendly. It's a great city to just walk around in. I love everything about that city. What do you like doing there when you're not playing? I'm assuming they let you go to the, the tennis matches? Did you ever do that? Yeah, I did that. Um, that was fun. Um, honestly, I love just walking around in that city. I remember... So one of my favorite things to do in any city is just, like, pick a general direction, maybe towards the water, and just walk without looking at a map and just see where it takes me. I had an amazing day in Melbourne where I ended up walking, like, 16 miles. Ended up, like, meeting and chatting with some people on the way, and just... Just such a beautiful city. It's a lot of fun. That's awesome. I, I don't know if I have it in me to walk 16 miles, let alone speak to strangers in a foreign country. But <laughs> uh, You're cut from a different cloth, I guess. <laughs> Who is the best poker player we've never heard of? Oh, um, I'm not really in tune. I mean, especially I play these like uh, these high roller turns with tons of coverage, so I guess the people I know are... Or well, is there anybody who's flying under the radar in them that uh, you think deserves more um, attention? I mean, a lot of people don't know the guys that are really crushing it uh, online uh, cash games. Like, if you don't know uh, Red OTB Baron, um, he's considered possibly the best no-limit player in the world right now, um, but he never plays live, so a lot of people don't know about him. Uh, Fish 2013 is up there, but he's starting to play some of the live tournaments. Uh, honestly, there's always going to be some 21-year-old kid that just picked up the game that I don't know about, though. I'm not really in tune with that scene. Did you have any jobs before poker? I have never had a job in my life. Never? Never. Never filled out like a W-2? No, well, for poker I have, but... Uh, I mean, when I was 16, I made $4,000 playing poker that summer. When I was 17, I had a six-figure bankroll. So. Never a paper route or... Uh... What no. about uh, pocket money for mowing the lawn? Yeah, I, I used to get paid five dollars for chores around the house, like taking the trash out. But I don't think that really counts. Uh, least favorite thing about the poker world? Um, this is where you can rant if you want. It just kind of bears down on your soul. Uh, one thing that took me like seven years into my career to realize was that every day I'm 
literally forced to hide my emotions. And that really weighs down on you. Um, I was, you mean because you're because it's a tell? Yeah, yeah. You can't just. You're be, literally suppressing happiness or disappointment to have robot face. Exactly. You have to do it to be a successful live poker player. But what I didn't realize was that that was affecting my everyday life. I would be less excitable about fun things. I would smile less often, and it was. Um, oh wow! I never even thought about that. Oh, it's huge. And I had been dating a girl for two years before she told me, like, you're so hard to read, you never express your emotions. And once she told me that, like, it was kind of a turning point in my life, and I made a, a real effort. It took a lot of work to try to change that. And I would just literally practice smiling and practice showing excitement for things. And I'm still not as good as, it, as I would like to be, but it's something I still work at. We always end the podcast with a random question from the random question generator describe your perfect man or woman oh wow um <laughs> just one that's not very a poly, it's not a very poly question um, well, i don't know if you want to bring up <laughs> the, the polyamory uh you are one who who, who believes uh in, in sharing the love with all i am Th this idea that like okay whatever you do with your male friends you can have as many as you want that's great the way you treat your family, like, okay, you can have that relationship with more than one person, that's great. How you treat your significant other, if you treat anyone else like that, you are cheating. <laughs> if you share intimacy with anyone else, you're cheating. If you share your emotions on a personal level with someone of the opposite sex, then you're cheating. And, like, that's just absurd. Like, quite frankly, what I do with my genitals with one person has no bearing on how I feel or my relationship with another person. And also just the idea that, like, here's how everyone should live their life you go to college you get a job you get married you have kids and anything other than that's unnatural like just let people do what they want yeah people well, i can get behind to... that idea i don't know if i me personally can get behind or, or get over the jealousy aspect of polyamory but i do love the idea of staying out of everyone's business <laughs> and letting people do what they want Absolutely. And I, and I actually think that polyamory gives you tools to work on jealousy. It's something you can work on just like anything else. And uh, honestly, even uh, people that have no interest in polyamory that will never be a part of it, they could gain a lot from reading uh, poly books. Uh, there's a book more than two. And I've learned a lot of stuff that have nothing to do with poly, just like direct communication. Because communication is so important in poly yeah. relationships. But um, the way they approach their relationships, it's just super healthy, and I think it would help a lot of people with their monogamous relationship problems. It's becoming a thing that uh, is becoming less stigmatized, I think. Oh, for sure. My first introduction to poly, long before I had ever heard the word polyamory, was so my aunt's a doctor. She was in town for some doctor's conference in Vegas, and I had lunch with her and a coworker. And her coworker was also a doctor, and she was in a triad which means a for her it was a three-way lesbian relationship and they had one stay-at-home mom who had carried the baby for the three of them and mm -hmm. the other two work full-time and they've been happy doing this together for 10 years and the second i heard this i was like wow that is just Whatever the works. greatest thing i've ever yeah. heard that's awesome yeah why not <laughs> <laughs> three parents are better than one right yeah and like uh, the ratio of having one parent stay at home and one work, it's kind of off. I think the ratio of having one parent stay at home and two work full time is much better. Well, pretty soon no one's going to have a job uh, because of these implants in our brain. Oh, yeah. The and, robots uh, will do all the work for Everyone us. will basically be able to stay home all day anyway. So. That's going to be great. Virtual reality 24-7. <laughs> Just plug me in. <laughs> exactly. The Matrix. Uh, Justin, thank you so much for taking the time out before a big tournament to talk with us. Good luck. Thank you, Julio. Whoa, the random question really delivered on that one. Thanks again to Justin. You can follow him on Twitter, at Justin Bonomo. Uh, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. Let us know what you think of the show by sending an email to pokerstories at cardplayer.com, and you'll be eligible to win a free subscription to Card Player Magazine. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to head to cardplayer.com slash link slash fantasy draft for top-notch daily fantasy sports contests and to claim your free digital subscription to Card Player Magazine. If you are a fan of football, baseball, basketball, hockey, or even golf, 
then you'll love Fantasy Draft's larger payout zones and contest entry caps, which gives new players a great shot at winning. Once again, cardplayer.com slash link slash fantasy draft.